Um, okay. I can start this all off. So I want to thank you all for joining us for Antarctica Day. Um, today is December 13th, 2019. Um, my name is Janet Warburton. I work for the Arctic Research Consortium of the United States and I'm um, hosting uh, this Antarctica Day presentation. I'm, um, I'm working with and a couple of people are helping co-host and supporting Antarctica Day uh, virtually with me. I'm in Anchorage, Alaska and I am assisted by Judy Fonstock who would like to say hello I'm sure. Hello everyone and I, I see Jocelyn has just joined us. Oh excellent Jocelyn. Okay. Perfect timing. Very good, Jocelyn. Let's see where where did she show up, Judy? Okay, you made her co-host. There we go. And um, so Judy is joining us from New Hampshire. She is also part of Arcus. Um, we also have with us uh, Dr. Jim Madsen. Go ahead and say hello. Hello, hi everyone. And um, also, uh, we have, um, uh, I'll get to Jocelyn in Antarctica in a moment, but there's a couple of other people that I'd like to introduce. Um, Armando, I know you introduced yourself before, but go ahead again, and please, for the last little bit of people that joined us, introduce yourself again. Hello, everyone. Joining from San Juan, Puerto Rico, I'm a Polar Trek alumnus from 2014-2015, the Polar Trek Antarctic season, uh, and it's a pleasure to be here. Great, we're glad you're here. And another uh, wonderful person that is online, I hope she can get her microphone to work, is Julie Berkman, and she uh, is with Our Spaces. So Julie, would you like to introduce yourself and Our Spaces? Hello, can you hear me? <laughs> Yep. Great. Um, yes, I'm in Medford, Massachusetts right now, but our spaces got started in Cambridge, England, and uh, we created Antarctica Day um, after the 50th anniversary of the Antarctic Treaty so that youth around the world would know more about Antarctica and have uh, get to know more about the treaty itself. So I'm so happy that you've continued to do this all these years, and I look forward to hearing Jocelyn. Yes, very Thanks. good. You're welcome. It's nice to have you here, Julie. Thanks. And um, and we'd like to turn our attention down to South Pole, Antarctica. So Jocelyn, can you hear me? I can. Hi. Yay. Hi, nice. Nice to see you. All right. Um, so uh, with that, since we know that you can hear us and you're online and we can even see you, fantastic little bandwidth miracle happening right here. Um, <laughs> we'll get started with the presentation. Um, I'm going to have uh, Jocelyn and whoever else is presenting uh, just tell me to uh, cue the next slide and so forth. Um, I will start off real quickly with some background um, and then I'll turn it over to you, Jocelyn. All right. And uh, so with that, I think everybody has been uh, sharing where they're joining us from uh, in the chat box. Uh, if you haven't, please let us know where you are uh, joining us from. For the most of this uh, or presentation, you can keep your microphones muted until you want to ask your questions live, which will be towards the end. Um, it's fine for you to keep your video cameras on. Um, it's kind of fun to see all the kids and all that stuff. So don't worry about that. Um, if you start to have issues, you can type in the chat box uh, about things like you can't hear the presenter or we're going too fast or too slow or that you need to leave. Uh, this event is being archived and so we'll share it to everybody that's um, registered as well as posted online. Um, and if you have questions as we go along, just type them in the chat box. And again, at the end, we will answer them um, live. Um, and we'll also try to answer them as we go along. We have a lot of content experts with us today. So I think we should be able to handle most questions that come up uh, during this presentation. Uh, 
So a little bit of background as to why Jocelyn Jargi, the science girl, is in South Pole, Antarctica. Um, she is part of a program called Polar Trek, Teachers and Researchers Exploring and Collaborating. It's run by a nonprofit, which I introduced a little bit ago, Arctic Research Consortium of the United States. The main office is based in Fairbanks, Alaska, so in the Arctic or subarctic part of the world. And we place uh, educators like Jocelyn and others with researchers um, in both the Arctic and the Antarctic so they can learn about the different kinds of science that's happening in the polar regions and then bring that back to um, their communities and the people that they work with. So that's what Polar Trek is all about. Um, every year we focus on, um, we have a special day um, because we usually have an educator in uh, the Antarctic working um, in and around December 1st, which is the Antarctica Day. And we're gonna hear a lot about Antarctica Day and why it's very special. Um, and Jocelyn happened to be at South Pole, which is um, really cool during Antarctica Day. Uh, we were scheduled to do this presentation last week, but um, as Dr. Madsen explained a little bit ago, the satellites um, weren't allowing us to, one, connect with them at the right time, and then they also, um, were being used for other types of science. So we're gonna hear more about all of that in just a moment. Um, and I think actually this is our first slide, Jocelyn. Do you see the map? Yes, I do. Okay, so from here on out, I'm gonna let you take over and introduce all the um, content to us. And um, yeah, so just tell me when to go move forward, that's all. Okay, great. Alrighty, so um, here on our first slide is in blue is Antarctica. So that's where I am videoing from the bottom of the world. Um, and on the map, we have three locations that are pointed out. We have McMurdo Station, which is right along the coast, South Pole, which is currently where I'm at right now. And we have the Antarctic Peninsula. So we have US research stations at each of these um, locations. And when I first fly, when I first flew into Antarctica, I went through McMurdo Station and then flew into the South Pole right to the center, the bottom of the world. Um, and I'll get into a little bit more about the difference of those stations later. But first, can we go to the next slide? Um, talk a little bit about the history of Antarctic exploration, which I've been learning so much about explorers coming to Antarctica and the hardships they had to endure and the adventure that they had. It's pretty amazing because this continent um, that uh, over a little bit over a hundred years ago, a lot of us didn't know much about has really captured our imagination and has really it, um, encouraged explorers to come and find out what is at Antarctica? Is there life? Is, is it all, all ice? What can we do with this continent? Um, so here in the photos, if we look at the photo on the left, you see this like wooden hut. So this is called Discovery Hut and it's located on the coast of Antarctica. And I was very lucky to have a tour of the hut. So on the right, you can see the interior of the hut. And this hut was built by one of the very first Antarctic explorers. His name was Robert Scott. He was a British naval officer. And um, he and his crew built this hut right on, along the coast of Antarctica so that they could use it for shelter. Um, they could plan for their expeditions going into the continent and a lot of, um, a lot of planning and, and uh, safety <laughs> happened in this hut. It kept them alive for many, many days, many weeks, when the weather was not um, favorable enough to explore the rest of the continent. So this was really interesting because a lot of the inside of this hut is still very much intact. There's actually a seal that I saw in there um, that is pretty well preserved. The blubber still melts during the summer months and freezes during the winter months. Um, because of, of the weather and the conditions, a lot of the things inside of the hut are very well preserved. And you can see just how they lived and how they survived. 
so this hut again was built by Robert Scott, one of the very first um, expeditions to Antarctica, but he was actually the second person to reach the South Pole by only a month. So the very first person to reach the South Pole a month earlier, can we go to the next slide, please? His name was Roald Amundsen, and he was a Norwegian, Norwegian explorer. So in December of 1911, um, Edmondson and his men reached the South Pole first, and then a month later, Robert Scott and his men reached the South Pole. So there was a little bit of a race. Everyone wanted to be the very first person to reach the bottom of the world. Um, and we have these two explorers that were very neck and neck and kind of reached it pretty close, pretty close timing. <laughs> um, so that was in 1911, a little bit over a hundred years ago. And around the same time, we have a scientist, his name was Victor Hess, who discovered something called cosmic rays. So when we have really high energy events that are happening around us in the universe, um, beyond the solar system, things like when stars explode, they create something called cosmic rays, which are just radiation that kind of showers down into the universe. And these cosmic rays, Victor Hess discovered, were reaching the Earth and were detectable. We could, we could see them, we, could, um, we can notice their presence. And that was uh, really revolutionary. Nobody had um, understood that we were experiencing cosmic rays from these, from these events happening so far away from us. <laughs> so this was around the same time, which is really interesting because these two, um, these two accomplishments kind of set the foundation for everything we do, for most of what we do here at the South Pole. So we have Edmondson and Scott, who wanted to be the first to discover the South Pole and see what resources were there, what kind of science we could do. And then Victor Hess, who discovered cosmic rays, which is um, something that we still study at the South Pole today. So can we go to the next slide, please? There we go. Um, so this is a photo of the ceremonial South Pole, and you can see this location from the windows in our galley. So the galley is where we eat. It's kind of like our cafeteria. Everyone gathers there for mealtime, and it has a a wall of windows and you can see right out onto the ceremonial South Pole. It's very beautiful. It's also a great place to see kind of what the weather is going to be like in the morning. It's either very clear, blue skies, or like today it's a little bit overcast um, and the visibility isn't that great. But um, the ceremonial South Pole has 12 flags representing the the first 12 countries to sign the Antarctic Treaty. And that's, that's primarily what we're celebrating for Antarctica Day. It's now been 60 years since we've signed the Antarctic Treaty. And these were the first 12 countries to join together and decide that we needed this treaty in place. And the purpose of the Antarctic Treaty is to protect Antarctica because Antarctica is a very special place it doesn't have a, a human population that's from here. It's very large, has a lot of very unique features. And these 12 countries decided that we need to be responsible with Antarctica, with our, our science here, any of our work here, and we need to make sure that we're using Antarctica for peaceful scientific research and the treaty also banned any military activity. So the treaty does not allow any use of radioactive waste or um, any non-peaceful activities. The treaty also makes it so that no one country owns Antarctica. So it's, it's everyone's land for scientific research, but it's no one's land. <laughs> and that's very important in um, sharing information and doing research, being able to collaborate with other countries um, when using everything that we have on this continent. 
So that's primarily what we're celebrating for Antarctica Day is that we are protecting this continent, we are using it responsibly for scientific purposes, and that we are um, enjoying it together. So currently, the number has grown from 12 countries to 53 countries that are part of the Antarctic Treaty. So um, the number has grown very, very much. And can we go to the next slide, please? 20 years after the Antarctic Treaty came something called the Antarctic Conservation Act. So you might have heard the word conservation before. It means to um, save something, to try to keep it as brand new as you can, try not to harm it. And 20 years after the Antarctic Treaty, the United States decided that we needed something that was more specific to maintain Antarctica as clean and as new as first time we found it. So here in this photo, we see a penguin that lives in Antarctica. And then we also see Benjamin on the right, a penguin that is visiting Antarctica. And we want to make sure that all of the visitors, like Benjamin and myself, protect this continent so that the penguins and the life that lives here can continue to flourish, can continue to grow and feel safe and feel um, comfortable in their environment. So us visitors, we don't want to change this environment too much. We don't want to harm it because that will harm all of the, all of the um, life and the animals that are originally from Antarctica. And it's really important to protect Antarctica so that we can also continue to do our research and have everything be as accurate and as safe as possible. So some things that the Antarctic conservation does not allow us to do is to leave, um, to leave any sort of trash or pollutants on the continent. So for example, here at the South Pole, there are about 120 people right now. And as people do, we generate trash. So if we eat a Snickers bar, we have the wrapper. Or um, if we don't finish all the food on our plate, sometimes we have some extra food scraps. Or if we use a hand warmer in our glove, we have trash that's left over. That's just the nature of living day to day is we produce some garbage. And normally we just throw it in the trash can, right? In the United States, you throw it in the trash can, and then you take it out to the dumpster on trash day and you kind of forget about it. But here at the South Pole, we can't just forget about all of the trash that we make. So all of the trash that we make here at the South Pole, at McMurdo Station on the coast, on the Antarctic Peninsula, we have to package up all of our trash and get it off of the continent. So we either put it on an airplane or put it on a ship and we get it away from Antarctica so that we can dispose of it properly in the United States. And that's part of um, this concept that we call leave no trace. So leave no trace. Make it so that the animals that live here, like the penguins, don't realize that we were here visiting. They, they're not impacted and they're not hurt by our time here. So that's one of the ways that the Antarctic Conservation protects um, the continent. So can we go on to the next slide, please? Alrighty, so now it's been almost 100 years after Amundsen and Scott um, dis, uh, first reached the South Pole. It's also been a little bit over 100 years since Hess's discovery of cosmic rays. And here at the South Pole, we're kind of putting those two things together um, to continue to study different things about the universe and different things about astronomy. So I'm going to take you on a little um, tour of how I got to the South Pole, beginning with McMurdo Station on the next slide. So I first flew into McMurdo Station, which is right along the coast of Antarctica. So um, it's right along um, the Ross Sea and the Ross Ice Shelf, but it's not an ocean. <laughs> it was frozen. Um, so it was all ice for miles. It was very beautiful and very different from like the ocean back home in California. 
Um, so McMurdo Station is quite large. When I was there, there was about 900, and 90 people, almost a thousand people living and working at McMurdo Station. And that is made up of scientists and support staff, all kinds of roles and, and um, jobs uh, make up those thousand people that, that live there. And I was there for about three days. The temperature was an average of about 20 degrees Fahrenheit, which is very cold to me. Um, usually back home is around 60 to 70 degrees. So it was quite cold. Um, and the type of science that happens at McMurdo Station is, um, is, is, is a lot. There's a lot of things going on because one, it's very large, but also um, because McMurdo Station is on the coast of Antarctica, they are able to do a lot of biology, um, a lot of biology research. So, for example, they have an aquarium at one of their laboratories. They do a lot of um, behavioral studies on different aquatic life. And they also have research that studies the land, research that studies the atmosphere. So there's a lot of science going on. There's um, just a lot going on in general at McMurdo because it's quite large compared to the South Pole. So can we go to the next slide, please? So now I'm at the South Pole. I flew from the coast at McMurdo to the middle, to South Pole Station. And this has been my home for two weeks and it's going to be my home for another two weeks. There it is, it's so beautiful. Um, the South Pole Station is a lot smaller. So instead of almost a thousand people at McMurdo, we have about just over a hundred. We have about 120 right now, I think. And that number changes as people come and go every day or every week. And the South Pole Station is also a lot colder than McMurdo. And one of the reasons it's a lot colder is because it's a lot higher than McMurdo. So McMurdo is right along sea level because it's right along the coast. The South Pole Station is about 9,000 feet above McMurdo. So we're very, we're at a very high altitude and that makes the weather a lot colder. Yesterday it was about negative 20 degrees Fahrenheit, so 20 below. And it also makes the air a lot drier because we're so high, um, there's not very much humidity, which is great for the research, but um, makes it something to get used to when you first arrive. So a lot of the research that happens at the South Pole Station has to do with the universe, has to do with astronomy and physics because we're so high up and the air here is so clear because we don't have a lot of water in the air. So a lot of that research is possible in these very, very, very unique conditions. So there it is, the South Pole. So speaking of research, I want to give a quick overview of um, the laboratory that I'm working with here. So can we go to the next slide, please? So I'm working with the Ice Cube Laboratory, which is a huge, incredible project that's happening here at the South Pole. I'm actually going to lift up my laptop here and see if I can see if you can see the laboratory through the window. So we are pointing out towards the front of the station. I don't know if it's gonna work. Let's see. Yep, we see uh, it. We see the flag. You see it? Yep, and we see the snow. That is cool. People, you are having a live view of South Pole, Antarctica right now. That's awesome. South Pole. There we go. And then this building, these buildings right over here, <laughs> they're very tiny. One of them is the South Pole Telescope, and the other smaller one is the Ice Cube Lab. <laughs> cool. So it is about, it's about a mile from the station. You can walk there. Um, you can also drive a snowmobile there. Both are very fun ways to get there. Um, and the Ice Cube Lab, as you can see in this picture on the left, it's this blue building with these silver drums on the side. And if you look in the middle of the photo, at the very, very top of the ice, 
you can see this blue building. That's our ice cube laboratory. And this is to show you how big the experiment is around the laboratory. So it's about a cubic kilometer around the laboratory. And below the lab, the ice cube lab, we have up to a mile and a half of holes that have been drilled into the ice. Deep, 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 deep. And inside each of these holes is a long string with these doms, these globe-like structures. So I think you can see one on the left, the bottom left, these globe-like structures are called DOMs or digital optical modules. And they are buried up to a mile and a half in the snow. And these DOMs, in the snow and the ice, <laughs> these DOMs are detecting light from neutrinos that pass through the ice. So can we go to the next slide, please? So I mentioned earlier a little bit with cosmic rays and when we have really big events that happen in the universe like exploding stars, supernovas, they create these particles, these cosmic rays. And within those particles, we have these tiny, 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 tiny particles called neutrinos that travel undisturbed for majority of their life. So even right now, we have like trillions and trillions of neutrinos just passing through us. We don't even notice. But every once in a while, very rare occasions, these neutrinos will interact with a nucleus. And every once in a while, these neutrinos will interact with the ice here at the South Pole. And when they do, they create this burst of light. And we are able to see that light and, and quantify it. So when we see that light, we're able to tell what direction the neutrino was traveling in, how much energy the neutrino had, and we use that information to figure out where did this neutrino come from? What big event is happening around us that is producing these neutrinos? So it's kind of a way to study uh, the sky, the universe, um, almost in a, a reverse fashion by detecting things that are being created and then tracing them backwards to see where they came from. Can we go to the next slide, please? So the expedition here is for the Ice Cube Neutrino Laboratory, and it's also for the Ascarian Radio Array, or ARA. So the Ascarian Radio Array is another, um, another experiment that is able to detect neutrinos, but instead of um, detecting light that neutrinos produce, like the ice cube lab, the ARA detects radio frequencies that these neutrinos also produce when they interact with the ice. And so we have a lot of antennas spread out miles apart along the ice that detect changes in the radio frequencies and we can reverse this and trace it back to, are there neutrinos present? Where are they coming from? What kind of energy do they have? And it's very interesting that where, in the section where the ice cube lab is and the Ascarian radio array is, we're not allowed to have our radios on. Um, we're not allowed to bring any type of radio frequencies into that section because it can interfere with the research going on. So it, the section's completely um, one of the most quiet areas on the planet in regards to radio frequencies. And that's why we're able to detect changes that might be due to neutrinos. So that's a little overview of the science um, that we're doing here at Antarctica. Um, and I believe that's the end. So I think we can switch over to questions now. Um, if yes. Has... Yeah. Uh, um, so good job. I wanted to see if uh, Jim or um, Armando or any of the other um, people have anything they'd like to add at the moment. And in the meantime, while they're thinking about that, um, 
Yeah, we do have some questions. There was a question from, I forgot, it said, um, how close have you come to uh, the penguin? Um, I'll show you. I'll show you how close I've come. This close. <laughs> um, this is the closest that I have been to a penguin during my time here. Um, there are no penguins at the South Pole. There aren't any animals here. It's too cold, it's too dry, the environment's too harsh. Uh, along the coast at McMurdo, penguins are said to appear, but when I was there, everything was still frozen and there were no penguins in sight. I'm hoping I might be able to see some on the way back, but it might still be frozen. <laughs> so this, this is the closest I've gotten, just me and Benjamin here. We have a question here from Mrs. Chung's class. Hi. Hey. Go ahead. Hi. Kevin, go ahead. How cold is it over there? How cold is it over there, Princess? It is quite cold. So today, I think it's about, so we have two temperatures that the station gives us every morning. One temperature is our ambient temperature, and one the other temperature is called the wind chill temperature. So today, the ambient temperature is about negative 12 degrees um, Fahrenheit. So if I go outside and there's no wind, then it's about negative 12 degrees. But there's usually wind here. So with the wind, it can get up to negative 30, negative 35 degrees Fahrenheit. So the wind makes everything feel colder. Great question. Okay, there's a, another um, questions that came in from Ken Williams. He says, how many miles from McMurder to the pole and how long was the flight? So, uh, well, you're in, and I'll go back to that one slide if I can here. Yeah, great question. Um, so, someone correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe it's about 500 miles. Because we recently had a South Pole Traverse that drives from McMurdo to the South Pole. They don't take a plane they drive from McMurdo to the South Pole, and I believe they said they traveled 500 miles, but I don't, I don't remember exactly. Um, I did not drive to the South Pole. I did take an airplane, and it, it took about three hours to get here, um, so not too long. It was, it was quite, a nice, quite a nice flight, felt short. Okay, and um, I'm sure there's some people that can answer that and respond while I go through questions. Um, let's see, uh, Estrada has another question. What do you mostly do um, for your job? Ooh, great question. I, <laughs> I've actually been wanting to film a little video for everyone about my daily routine, but I quickly realized on like the third day here that there is no real daily routine. Um, every day is very different because every day there's different tasks and different responsibilities that need to get done. So um, because I'm working with the Ice Cube Lab, right now we're working on a very specific project because all, all of our materials just arrived. So after this presentation today, I'm actually have my some of my cold weather gear on and after this presentation I'm going out about two miles into um, out, out there <laughs> past the station two miles out there and we're going to be deploying um, these devices into the ice Ooh, perfect so on the screen on the bottom right there's a picture of this device it looks a little um, tangly there's a lot of wires on it but it's a long, um, a long cylinder almost. And these devices were created to understand the ice better. So we are taking these devices and we're, we're lowering them down 
down into the ice, almost a mile down into the ice. And then we leave them there for a couple hours and we take different measurements. So the one, the device that you're seeing is actually measuring um, luminescence in the ice. So how light is scattering through the ice. And the reason that's important is because since we like to measure light, we need to understand how the light travels through the ice and any corrections we need to apply to our science. So that's what we're doing today, is we're lowering these devices into the ice um, to learn about how the ice carries light. But tomorrow, I don't know, we might uh, switch over to a different device or um, we might, I might switch over to a different project within Ice Cube. But every day is a little different, but I'll tell you what, every day, <laughs> I have to gear up, I have to put my red parka on, head outside and see what's going on <laughs> with the lab. Um, and um, yeah, so every day is a little different. That's a little bit of what we're doing today. It's a great question. Okay, another question came up from room 15. Um, how did you get your job at the, uh, they said the Arctic, but they mean Antarctica. So we'll, we'll stick with that. <laughs> Um, through Polar Trek. So um, Polar Trek um, was such an exciting program to hear about. I had a colleague who had done it before, but she did go up to the Arctic, up to the North Pole. Um, but when I heard that they, uh, you know, had an opening for the South Pole Station, I was very excited to be given this opportunity. So it's through Polar Trek. Polar Track, you can apply if you're an educator and you're interested in this opportunity. Applications open every year and they match you up with a researcher either here at the South Pole or up at the North Pole and they give you a lab to work with and you learn all about science happening at either sides of the earth. It's, it's very, very, very cool. Very cool. <laughs> I know it's hard not to use that like as a, as a plug. <laughs> <laughs> Our tagline, we are cool, <laughs> literally. <Yeah>. Um, <laughs> so uh, there is another question that came to me from um, another classroom. My students want to know how different are your day-to-day -day activ activities different than in California? Oh, wow. Woo. <laughs> Where do I begin? Okay, so the South Pole versus California. It could it be more different. Um, for starters, it takes me about 10 minutes to 15 minutes just to put on my cold weather gear to go outside. So yesterday I was helping one of my colleagues just start a snowmobile. They just needed me to go outside for like three minutes to help them start a snowmobile and it took me 10 minutes just to get dressed to go outside for three minutes <laughs> so that's a big difference um something i've had to get used to because in california you can just walk out the door um another thing that's very different is the the dryness the altitude is is something to get used to um and I think I looked it up yesterday it was 70% humidity in California. That means 70% water in the air. And here it's less than 1%, um, which makes your nose hurt a little bit. It makes your uh, throat feel dry. It's a little hard at night when you're trying to sleep. So we have humidifiers that add water to the air at night and we also have to drink a lot of water a lot a lot more water um, because we dry out a lot faster so i think those are the two main differences oh and of course the cold <laughs> the cold um it's much colder here okay um yeah and vegetation is another big thing i don't yes. see plants there oh. I have been seeing white ice for days. <laughs> there's, there's no trees, there's no grass. Um, so it's, it, it looks different. I feel a little bit like I'm in another world because um, all of the changes, it, it makes you feel that way. But it's still our planet. It's just at the very, very, very 
bottom. <laughs> and another oh, in interesting oh, thing between uh, which, oh, sorry, somebody's asking a question. Go ahead. Who was it? Yeah, it's Kim. I was just wondering, how, how are you dealing with 24 hours of daylight? Ooh, that's a great question. I was nervous um, because the sun does not set here. 24 hours of sunshine during the summer months. So it looks like this at two in the morning, three in the morning, 7 p.m. every, every hour of every day. Um, I have cardboard blocking the window in my room to make it dark so that I can sleep. Um, so the cardboard has helped a lot to regulate my sleep, but sometimes if I get up at around 1130 at night just to go to the bathroom or to get some water um, and I see the sunlight through the window, it's, it's very, um, it wakes me up a little bit <laughs> and I have to kind of get tired again. So the sunlight keeps you very much awake but it's very helpful to all of the researchers here because the projects can be done at really odd hours if they need to be. If you need to get data at two in the morning, it's bright outside. So it's easy to go outside and, and do science if you need to um, late at night. So we have another question that came up. Has there been any impact due to climate change noticeable at McMurdo? So I don't know if you could answer that or maybe Dr. Madsen, but go ahead. Yeah, I actually was only there for three days during Thanksgiving break. So there wasn't a lot of science for me to see and explore. So I didn't get to see that. But um, yeah, if Dr. Madsen had some um, information on that, it'd be great. Uh, yeah, um, you know, that's not the area that we study. Um, so, you know, each year there's differences in um, how long the, um, the ice runways last and um, some other impacts. Um, so, uh, but, but Antarctica is very complicated because uh, it's so big, you know, it's about the size of the uh, continental United States. So, you know, there are like, like in the US, um, if you pick one spot, one one year it could be colder, one year it could be warmer, um, but uh, overall, you know, um, the the trends are that, that things are changing. Okay, um, let's see. We have lots of other questions that came up too. Um, do you have to go through survival training to survive in the extreme weather conditions? Hmm, that's a great question. So we do have some training that we need to have in order to be able to work outside. Um, it's general field training that teaches you about what locations you should not walk into. So the station is, is very organized outside. There are different flags that tell you that you can walk here or if you cannot walk here. So there are black flags that um, surround areas where there might be cracks in the ice or it might just be dangerous. There might be experiments there. Um, so on the left, you can see some of those flags. There are a row of green flags. That means A-OK. -okay. So the row of green flags is the walkway to get to the ice cube lab. So if you just walk along those green flags, everything's good. Um, if you start to see black flags, that means don't walk there. It's very dangerous. And they, they give us that kind of training. Um, so it's really up to every person to be responsible as to where they can and cannot walk because you do not want to get stuck outside. It's very cold and our gear is great. It keeps us warm, but um, we still don't want to be outside for longer than we have to. Okay, cool. Um, and uh, you wear that big red jacket, my word. Looks like you have a lot of um, gear on when you're outside. Let's see, there's a picture of you all dressed up. Yes. 
<laughs> okay, we have um, another is. question. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Jocelyn. Oh, I was just going to say that's, that's what I have to put on every day <laughs> to go outside. Um, you have to get bundled up and make sure you have the least amount of skin exposed because you can get frostbite very, very quickly. So we have a lot of equipment to protect us. Okay, um, uh, from another classroom, my students want to know if there are other animals in Antarctica besides penguins. Yes, there are. So when I was at McMurdo, I got to see some seals um, that were right on the ice. And um, I got to see a baby seal, actually, who had just been born a few days ago. So um, they, there are other animals besides penguins. There were a lot of seals. And something interesting I learned, which makes sense now, um, every time that you see a seal on the ice, that means that there's some sort of hole in the ice nearby that helps the seal come up and go back down. So even though it was fun to see seals, it was also kind of an indication that, hey, that area of ice is probably not safe because there's probably holes there for the seals. And I actually went um, cross-country skiing in McMurdo and there was also a seal a few a few feet away from the the path. So I got pretty close, um, but because of the Conservation Act, we're not allowed to get closer to the seals. You don't wanna disturb any of the animal life here. Um, you wanna make it so they don't know that you're there. Okay, and um, to follow up, I posted in the chat area that there was a recent expedition where we had a a teacher from um, back east that uh, was with the SEAL uh, researchers and they were following all of the pups being born. It's really interesting science. Um, okay, another question. Is there a mile deep hole in the ice and how many holes one mile deep? I think they're talking about the ice cube. Oh, the ice cube, yes. And you, where's the picture? There we go. Yes, so there are, um, so each of these holes are up to 2,450 meters, so about a mile and a half. And um, Dr. Madsen, please correct me. I think that, is it 80? Is it 80 drilling holes? I forget the number. Yeah, there's 86. 86 melted but, there they, oh, right there. but they but they've all frozen back in so after we get yes. the elements in then there's water in the holes that refreezes except maybe you could say a yes, little bit about exactly. the ice core because that one stayed open right that that hole is filled the spice core yes yeah, absolutely. So these, um, like Dr. Madison said, the holes that we drilled around the ice cube lab have all frozen now. They were once open to put in our doms, but they're frozen. We have one hole right now that's called Spice Core that is still open, and that's about a mile away from the laboratory. That's where I'm going today. So this hole is about a mile deep and um, it has a, a liquid inside called estazole that keeps it from freezing over. And the reason why they still have this hole open is so that they can put devices into the ice that measure different things about the ice. Like we wanna know how light travels through the ice. We have a different device that is measuring how radio frequencies are detected through the ice. And this is really important because the ice is very different than what we imagined it to be. There are a lot of things that we want to understand so that our research is um, more accurate. Um, and the ice under, under the South Pole is not just all the same. There are different parts of the ice that 
look differently. Um, most of it is transparent, but there is a layer that is darker called the dust layer. And that holds um, like lava and ash from uh, an eruption or an explosion that happened many, 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 many years ago. So there's different components of the ice that we want to understand, which is why we keep one hole still open so we can put in our devices. And that's one of the biggest projects that's happening this year um, here at the South Pole. All right, great. Um, so there are some people that are signing off. Don't worry about it. Um, we'll archive this and share the last little tidbits. We're going to wrap up here pretty soon, but we have a few more good questions uh, coming in from students. Um, from uh, Chung's class, my students want to know what you studied in college in order to become a researcher slash scientist. They also think it's so cool that you went to school in Paramount. We appreciate you. We are at Roosevelt School in Paramount. Cool, Paramount. Yes, Paramount is my um, where I went to school uh, in elementary school. Um, hi, and um, I have great memories of Paramount, so I'm so excited that you are all able to join. Um, in college, I actually studied biochemistry, so it's a pretty different from the work that I'm learning here at the South Pole. The South Pole research has um, a lot of physics and engineering in it. So a lot of the scientists that I work with have physics backgrounds, they're engineers, um, and they kind of put those two together because we're building a lot of instruments. So that's a lot of engineering, but then we have to analyze a lot of physics data and a lot understand a lot of physics concepts. So, um, but that's not to say there's, there's also biology research, but it's happening along the coast of Antarctica where you're closer to the water. So throughout Antarctica, I think there's a lot of different sections of science that are being applied. Um, so I think there's, there's room for everyone, everyone's interest, but primarily at the South Pole, it's very physics based. And um, it's exciting because I see researchers from, that are coming from all over the world to come here and, and to, to do their science. Um, and they, they all come from different backgrounds, different walks of life, and we're all joining together, working together to, to learn more about, about the South Pole and about our universe. Very exciting. Um, do you want to share a little bit about your show, Jargi the Science Girl? I don't know that everybody knows your... Yes, oh. yes. I would, let me grab that. So um, Jargi the Science Girl is a show that combines science and theater. We perform at schools all over California, and we just started performing at theaters throughout the country. So we were at um, Washington DC at the Smithsonian this year. We were also up in Washington state and in, um, in Seattle, we did a tour there of the libraries. And what the show does is basically we take a few science concepts and we get to do experiments together. So it's me and Benjamin in our laboratory and we bring up some lab assistants from the audience and you get to come up and do experiments with us and be a part of the show um, and ask lots and lots of questions. So that's a little bit of Jari the Science Girl. And while I'm here at the South Pole, I am filming and taking a lot of pictures that will show up in a future version of Jari the Science Girl. Awesome, thank you. Um, we have a couple more questions. One was, uh, what time zone are you in and can people visit Antarctica? Ooh, two good questions. So first, we are on the New Zealand time. So if you are in the United States, it is Friday. <laughs> Here at the South Pole, it is Saturday morning. Um, and right now it is what time is it? It's 7.05 in the morning right now, Saturday. So we're a little ahead of you. I'm in the future, but everything looks great. So, um, and then can people visit Antarctica? Yes, they can. There is a tourist camp that is um, a little bit 
off station. You can see it from the galley, from the cafeteria. But it's a, a camp where tourists can buy a ticket to fly to Antarctica, and then you can buy a couple nights at the camp. When I first got here, my first day, there was a group of tourists that were taking a tour of the station. So people can visit Antarctica, but because we are a research station, we are um, not open to the public. So tourists can come take a tour, but they are not able to use um, our facilities because they are reserved for our research projects. All right, thank you. So um, I just pushed out our thank you slide to um, for everybody to see. In case I didn't mention it earlier, Polar Trek is funded by the National Science Foundation and run by Arcus. So we greatly appreciate funds to support uh, educators like uh, Jocelyn and uh, working with researchers like Dr. Madsen and the Ice Cube Project. Um, and also to support things like Antarctica Day and allow us to all have a little glimpse about what it's like to be at the bottom of the world. And so oh, yeah. so if I, we yeah. have people out there that want to say goodbye or, or thank you. You're welcome to open up your mics and do that. Bye. I'd like to invite everybody to... Uh...